So welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming today. This is going to be a fun one. Uh, Mask Pro has been a part of my toolkit for quite a long time. And um, so, so I'm happy to be a part of it. I originally started doing photo compositing a long time before even digital came out. Uh, pin registering transparencies in the dark room, um, doing multiple camera exposures. My goal has always been to, to um, reveal a, more of a depth in photography. And so when digital came out, uh, I just said, oh my God, thank you, God, you know, this was meant for me. And so I've really adapted all these tools. And Mask Pro has been one of those tools. It's been a real steady uh, workhorse for me. So I thought I'd start out showing just some of my composited uh, fine artwork that um, I've been doing for the last few years. And let me see if I can get this going. I will just do this and go through some of this. So, you know, most of my work is all created by layering anywhere from four to several dozen photos together. And they can be, you know, all one photo dissected in separate ways or multiple photos that I blend together to create these. And I started with some flower series and uh, I really loved being able to create a more graphic, um, deep emotional image um, from a number of photos than sort of the surface gloss of just, um, you know, one image. Um, it just gives a whole new dimension to the work. And you can, uh, you know, I take a lot of desperate, uh, disparate, I guess I want to say, images where it's things like the flowers and then concrete walls and scratched uh, surfaces, scratch paint um, in the background of this particular Gabura Daisy image, there's the top surface of an old Chinese antique trunk and uh, um, a Polaroid peel and a, you know, anywhere probably close to a dozen different images. And with the help of Mask Pro and other selection techniques, I can create, I can, I can separate images from their background and create whole new pieces. This is really a fun one. Uh, I had a friend give me a case of these beetle insects uh, as a gift one time. It had maybe eight uh, beetles, really intriguing looking things in his case because he knew I liked weird things. And I thought, oh my God, I can't just hang this on the wall. I have to break it open and photograph these things. And I looked up at him pleadingly and I said, can I bust this open? And he said, well, I figured you would. So I immediately started doing this insect series, which was really fun for me. And um, I shot with a large format camera and a high res digital back. And each of these was actually shot three times, one down at the level of the feet, one sort of mid insect and one at the top level. And then the focused areas blended together and then the backgrounds created from up to a dozen different images of different textures that I've shot and so forth. Here's another one. I always wonder, then I, you know, I got so excited by the beetles, I decided that I should, you know, get some more bugs. And so I went on to eBay and started ordering bugs from all over the world and we'd get these funny little wrap packages that smelled a little odd in the studio. And I was like a kid on Christmas and bust these open and photograph them and then put these pictures together. And uh, it's it's been a pretty fun experience. So a lot of selection techniques. Um, this, and just to tell you that it's not all easy, you know, I mean, making a good selection is critical in doing composites. And sometimes you're driven just by what you see as the final piece of art. This was a royal palm that I shot in Hawaii and I shot, it's the only one I saw that just had the perfect shape and form and I shot it, but the background behind it was a hillside filled with leafy green um, vegetation. And I actually went in and outlined every single palm frond of each frond. And it, you know, it was a spare time project for me uh, that lasted about three months. 
and some and then it led to doing you know sometimes you have a vision of what a scene means to you but you want to amplify it so that it has more meaning and this led to creating composite imagery of scenes so the lake sunset scene was shot in one place and the dock in another place and blended together and then I took a trip to China and it led to a completely new feeling I wanted I was in, impressed with the Chinese scroll art from the Guilin area of China and wanted to pay tribute to it so this was um, probably about a dozen different images from around China that I composited together to create this piece of scroll art and we were up in the Sea of Finland up outside of um, um, Russia and Finland and, and they had all these islands all over the place and so this is a composite of about a dozen images that's kind of my fantasy version of what we saw there and started doing the same thing with objects so it really it you know it, your imagination you know I, it, these are tools that really expand what photography can be all about um, this again this was an interesting one because this particular machine was a uh, an old x-ray plate holder in the uh, princess's courtyard in um, outside Beijing in the summer palace and it was all behind plexiglass and I photographed it thinking god someday I need to do something with that I don't know what and then it's like you wake up one morning and it's like ah well you're going through the library and here's this picture of an old guy on the, the sidewalk reading a newspaper I can use his head and I can use a background of that old uh, apartment in behind and a picture of the mountains from Guilin and some of the birds there and all of a sudden you know, I call this piece trans -mi um, transmigration and then I started doing a whole series of images um, of the characters that I would meet uh, that became I call them cinematic narratives where I can sort of tell a story about and you know, it's kind of my movie poster memory of what these um, people and places were like so these are so it's pretty fun you're you know you're able to create um, a whole different um, kind of image that's that's um, meaningful to you some from uh, a trip down to Mexico it takes just a second for the screen to uh, resolve <laughs> this is um, my brothers and I and a friend of ours out uh, up on a horseback trip up in the, the uh, wilderness in the, the Rocky Mountains and we got chased off the mountain in a snowstorm and I'd wanted to get a group shot of us and that's me holding the rope and um, so when we all got down I wouldn't let anybody shower until I got individual shots of everybody and then pieced this sort of tribute to our adventure together and sometimes you just do it for fun and this is what we're going to build today I uh, and I'll, I'll just escape out of here and get back into work mode but this image started when I was thinking about doing some photography workshops to teach people about compositing and selecting images and so forth and uh, David Volkmer and I actually put our heads together and formed a company that I'll tell you about a little bit later we've got a website called Photomorphous and uh, um, you know it's my goal that we offer a, a, a site that has a you know a community where people can go if they're interested in doing this uh, this kind of work and learning more about it so with that let me go to um, our files here back to the library Okay, so uh, this all starts when you're driving around and you come upon a scene that calls to you to photograph it. I was on my way to an art fair in Utah and pulled off the road out at a rest stop and came up to the top of this kind of winding hill with a great vista and this very odd looking building was sitting up there uh, just calling to me to photograph it and uh, 
I was intrigued. The function of this building was never fully understood um, or explained. And it had this nice little path up to this top of the knoll. Now, around this building were other scenes um, that showed, you know, some of the Buttes of Vista and so um, that were, were really interesting to me as well. And the first thing I thought of when I looked at this was it looks like kind of the a little bit more adult version of the little rocket launchers that I used to use as a kid to shoot up these little water rockets and so forth with that little stick up there. And, I, you know, that started my imagination going and one thing led to another. And um, we end up with the image that um, we saw the rocket guy. And so the first thing that I needed to do was go through my library and say, okay, how can I realize this shot? And these are, let me just um, bring it up here this way. So with these files, this is a, a, a shot of a model that I'd done um, in my studio uh, that I had in my files. The rocket is a vertical panorama that I put together of a rocket ship in the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. There's our rocket launcher image. And I wanted to spice up the image of the rocket launcher with this background of some of the vistas and clouds. And you'll never find me very far from textures. I photograph textures constantly, blend them together in a lot of different ways, and they become integral to um, my work. So let's start with um, creating the scene of the rocket launcher and adding the clouds behind. Okay, so let me switch over now to Photoshop. Let me just move my palettes just a little bit here so I can get them out of the way of my, there, okay. And so what I've done is I created, um, I brought in the rest of the image and then I brought in the cloud image in behind it. And then I transformed the cloud image behind the rest stop image by just reducing the opacity of the overlaying rest stop image so that I could see kind of where I wanted to put the clouds, how big they were, and where I want the ridge line of these buttes. And I liked the fact that they kind of formed this little V and um, made the hero rocket launcher stand out, okay? So the challenge then is to isolate this foreground and building from this sky background and add in the clouds. The way that Mask Pro works and why we call it the Swiss Army knife of uh, um, positing workflow is that it's got a whole of tools that you can use all in one place with the sole function of creating the best mask possible um, as opposed to having to use a number of different tools in the Photoshop window. You have a lot of the same tools, um, but I really like the idea that they're all together in one place and we'll go through that right now first things that you have to kind of think about is how you want Mask Pro to, to set up. And I want it to be a, a mask, a layer mask. And so I am going to create a layer mask for that layer by clicking the layer mask icon down at the bottom of the palette um, for that layer. Then always make sure, the way that I work is I always make sure that I have the background that I want in behind that. Okay, so with the layer mask selected, we go up to File, Automate, and down to Mask Pro. And it'll open up the Mask Pro interface. Okay, show of hands, how many people are uh, proficient with Mask Pro out there? Brian, are you counting? <laughs> All right, well, this should be fun. That's a, that's a, that's a, <laughs> I, I asked for a show of hands. Okay. All right. 
Well, we're going to help today. That's the, our our purpose today is to help you out with that. Okay. So when Mask Pro opens, and so this is beautiful. Mask Pro opens, and you've got this toolbar that has all of your selection tools in it and tool options that are displayed here. Now there's two ways that Mask Pro works. Mask Pro works on a color basis, on a color contrast basis, which reminds me of one step that I should take before I go in. But I'll, I'll explain this, um, the, the layout of Mask Pro tool right here first. The color based selection tools are up here. There's a keep dropper and a drop dropper, keep and drop palettes, where you can create palettes of colors to keep and colors to eliminate. And the magic brush uses the keep drop colors um, to um, either add back in or subtract out uh, colors in creating a mask. There's also the hard edge tools. And the hard edge tools basically are your pen tool. There's the magic pen tool and the regular pen tool. And I really love using the pen tools in Mask Pro because I don't know how many of you use the pen tool in Photoshop and have worked for 45 minutes to get the perfect outline and then touched something on the keyboard or made some errand move and your path immediately goes away. Using the pen tool in Mask Pro is fail safe. And you can you can go back two dots, you can you can click to commit the path as a selection on your mask, and then if it's not quite right, do an undo and it comes right back. So there's a lot of advantages uh, to the pen tool here. So that's just a brief summary of these tools. Now what I'm going to do is I want to go back into um, Photoshop real quick. So I'm just going to close that. And I want to show you a little trick. Because in this particular image, and let me just zoom up here a little bit, in this particular image there's a, a bit of a color contrast going on right away that we can use to our advantage. The sky is primarily blue, the foreground and the building are primary yellow, red, green. So we have color contrast that we can use to our advantage. I'm going to duplicate this layer. I'm going to turn off my underlying layer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this layer and I'm going to add um, a hue saturation adjustment to it. And I'm going to amplify the saturation so that I increase the color contrast that I'm working with. And there's a real cool way in Photoshop 5, um, and I'm not sure if it's CS4 as well, but you've got this little hand slider that automatically selects the colors that you want to work with. So if you select that hand and you're in the hue saturation, click on the blues and let's pump up these blues here. Okay, so we get a nice contrast. And you can see how that's already popped our foreground out from the background. So if I turn it on and off, you can see what the additional contrast there is already done. Now you can keep going. I can select these yellows down here, do the same thing. You can watch the increase in the contrast to the reds and the yellows and the greens. Let's do the pink here a little bit too. So we've built up a nice color contrast here and that's going to um, that's going to serve us well when we get in here. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to click. Um, let me drop that back into my palette. Click out of that. Now I'm just going to merge that adjustment down onto that layer, and then I'm going to open. Make sure I select this mask because that's where I want um, my mask to go. I'm going to go back in here now. Select Mask Pro. Now the first thing I do when I get into the Mask Pro window is I always like to go zoom window. That just takes the background away and allows me to concentrate fully on the Mask Pro window. Then typically the second thing I do, I'll move this to the side, is zoom in. Typically when you're making selections, you're working in tight. 
okay so I'll just I'll go to a hundred percent sometimes I'll go to two hundred percent and then you can see where you're working now these hard edge outline of the building here it makes sense to start with the pin tool now the pin tool I suggest to everybody that they get um, conversant with the pin tool. You need to become proficient with the pin tool because it can be your best friend. And it's an excellent way to make selections. And essentially, you know, if you just click, you're connecting the dots. If you're going around a curve, and I'm going to do this for an illustration, you can click and drag, and it creates a curved line. Okay. Then if you click and drag again, the opposite direction, you can create another curve line. Here's what I mean about um, the Mask Pro interface. If I click delete, it gets rid of that last one. Delete again, it gets rid of that last one. Really a nice functional way um, to work. You don't ever have to worry about losing your work. Here's another trick if I'm uh, working with um, my um, pin tool, you can holding down the command or control key, you can grab that point and move it around and adjust it. You can grab the arms of that point and move them around and adjust it. You can grab really any point, move it around and adjust it. So it becomes a very pliable, workable thing that you can fine tune. If there was a curve in here and I connected it with a straight line, if you hold the cursor over that line, you'll see a little plus sign pop out by the cursor. You can just click and it adds another point. Then you can drag that to conform to the area that you want the um, line to go, your outline. Okay? So you you have complete control over all these things. And I'll just go in here and do a nice quick little outline. And I'll show you one more thing. This, let me zoom in here once more. The side of this building kind of juts out. There's another tool that you can use here called the magic pin tool. And you can shrink it down. And if you just click and drag, it actually conforms to, it tries to find the edge. And if you've got something that's uneven, sometimes that's a real nice tool to use. If it's a hard edge but it's kind of uneven, it's got some texture to it, that's a real good tool. And if you hold the control key down or command key on the um, Mac, you can revisit the line and have it refined edges until you're happy with it. Then you can click back to the pen tool and with Mask Pro I like to work in small segments at a time. You don't have to do the whole thing immediately. You can do um, little bits. So I'm going to just take out this little bit by connecting this dot. Now the pin tool, the keep drop tool, all of these work very similar to foreground and background color palette in um, the tool palette in Photoshop. But it's keep and drop. So in this instance, if I click, it would keep the color, and that's not what I want to do. I want to drop it, so I just click X or click on this little symbol to switch it to drop. And now you can see the cursor has a little minus on it, and you can click, and it gets rid of that section. Now, if I command undo, bingo, it's back. My path is back. I can rework it until it's perfect. So it's beautiful. The other thing that I should tell you is the tool options palette up here, whenever you choose a tool, it'll show up with some of your, um, some sliders to fine tune it. This actually gives you an option to vary how soft or hard the mask edge is. So if I wanted a real soft edge, for instance, you can see it's, you know, very soft. Undo that. So you can really fine tune it to kind of the edge that you want. Now, a couple of other things. I've made a selection and it's gotten rid of what I wanted to get rid of. 
but I'm seeing some color fringing right here that that I can show you um, how to get rid of quite simply. And there's one other thing that I want to mention, and that is down at the very bottom of the um, interface are some small symbols and squares that indicate how you want to view your mask. Right now, it's toggled to uh, transparency. If you want to put a color behind it, you can click on that solid square and you can choose what color to put behind it. And so you can put a color, solid color behind it to work. If you want to see what the actual mask is, it's the image right to the side of transparency. So that'll show you actually what the grayscale mask will look like on that layer. If you want to see, this is, this is sort of a preview that shows you how the mask is applied with the gray being like the blurred edge of the selection and then the black being totally opaque or you know transparent in this case now this is the this is the real benefit of this the farthest one to the right shows you the background that's underneath what i'm outlining so i can see right away how this top image is going to look against the bottom image. And I can see that I need to get rid of some of this um, excess foreground that's been kept. They've got a couple of tools that I use a lot to fine tune these selections. And one of them is this chisel tool. Again, you have an amount, a chisel amount, and a brush size sliders up here. So I'm going to just scale my brush down just a little bit. and give it about you know nine ten percent on that make sure that I'm subtracting and it let's just run that across and see what happens it's just like magic oh my god it's not like unreal it's like oh, what did we ever do without a chisel in Photoshop okay so look at that all right Okay, so I'm getting happier by the minute. Let's come over to this side and do the same thing. So that's the idea of Mask Pro and the Swiss Army Knife. I've already used, you know, about three different tools here um, in making selections. And there's even more. And you can just do a piece at a time. So let's do this top. Come down here. Grab hold of my command key. Let's just get this down in here. Bingo, 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 bingo. Fine tune it. You can lay them down kind of fast. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Command Z. <laughs> See how that works? I love it when the software works with you and not against you. Okay, so let's tighten these guys up. I'm going to go to the magic. Um, pen tool. Let's just rake it down here. Go back to the normal pen tool and let's just take out this little segment. Okay. Click on that. Grab my chisel tool. Uh, did a little bit better job putting my line down there. You can see I can just trim up a little bit of this. Great. Okay, I always too like to go back in and check my mask as well with this, uh, the one right next to it that gives you the preview. Okay, and it looks all good right now. So I'm going to zoom back out and very much, uh, well, identical to Photoshop. If you double click the hand icon, it fits the image to the window. Again, then I'm zooming the rest of the window out. If I double click on the magnifying glass, it would zoom into 100%. Now I'm just going to take the regular brush tool. And you can see it also has keep and drop colors. I mean, uh, keep and drop mode. And it's in drop mode right now, which is what I want. And I'm just going to get rid of the rest of the sky. Now if I click here, if you hold down the shift key and click over here, it'll draw just a straight line between clicks. So it's a real quick way to do that. Now, if I look at my mask, I have 
a black, complete black separating the sky and the foreground. So I can come in, use another one of their tools, it's the bucket tool, just click in there and all the sky goes away effortlessly, okay? So that is the bucket tool and it's used to fill areas. Now if I had gray connecting that foreground or background so there was you know, a lifeline for this bucket tool, it would fill everything with black. So you always need to look at your actual mask making sure that it's completely black before you fill in an area that you want to disappear completely. All right, so let's go back. All right, so it's looking pretty good. We just have this little area down here to deal with. I'm going to double click the magnifying glass again and maybe zoom in again. Now I've got, um, now I've got uh, it's color contrast that I can work with. And that's where the keep drop colors come in. So if you select the keep eyedropper, and it's the green one, you can either use the I key, which I like, or the O key, which is the um, drop color. So I and O, they're right next to together on the keyboard, and it's a real handy way to switch back and forth. So in the keep, I'm going to come in and identify the colors that I want to keep in the foreground. Well, I want to keep this grass, this white hay color and the dirt color and the green color and you can see it's building a palette of colors for me in the keep palette here. Let's go a little more. I want the shadow, the darker edges. So you want to get a good broad selection of the colors that you're going to keep. Let's go over here. The drop colors, same thing. We want to get rid of that. We want to get rid of that. We want to get rid of that. So, and if you click and drag, it averages all the values that you've dragged through. So you can you can you can make some um, good selections there. And there's another thing that you can do if you find that some of them are too close together in tone, you can eliminate in here. You can add back in. You can also double click on this color, and it'll bring up a color picker you can actually increase or decrease, you know, the tonality of it, or you can move the, you know, you can move it around till you get the identical color that you want. Ah, that's so sweet. That's so sweet. And that sometimes, if you get stuck in a particular area, that is a real handy thing to know, where you just need to build a little contrast between the colors that you're selecting, okay? So say okay. Bingo, it changes that particular color. All right, so now we're going to use the tool that really you, I think, the pin tools, magic pin and regular pin tool, and the brush tools, the magic brush and the regular brush, are the tools that you're going to probably use the most in Mask Pro. So you want to um, select a brush size that works for you here and set your transition. And the transition really um, is, you know, how broad um, a color bias do you want to build into your, your keep and drop. Um, so if you're using it for hair or some other areas where you want a real smooth transition between the colors that are kept and the colors that are dropped, uh, you would want to create this large soft transition and threshold down to less. Less is the amount of color that you want to, how do I want to say that? Sometimes I get tongue-tied explaining these things because I'm a visual guy. Um, anyway, yeah, this all really begs experimentation. And that's really how you have to look at a lot of, you know, whenever I have anything that's got sliders, any tool that I have with sliders, I take it to the extremes so that visually I understand what's going on. And I would suggest that to you. So now we can just start painting. Okay. Look at that. Wow. Not bad. Not bad at all. Okay.
Well, from here, it looks pretty good. I do, you know, I don't know, everybody's monitor is a little bit different, but I'm getting a little bit of haze right above my horizon. I just might take this transition down harder, just a little bit. Let's see what happens. Yep. Okay, that fine-tuned it very nicely. Okay. Now, the other tool that you can use, you can come in with the chisel tool as well. Say less maybe. Let's take a look at here and see what this does. Great. Okay, these are real subtle changes, but it shows you how you can really fine-tune and blend images together until it becomes very realistic. One other caution. We're looking at it with the background image in place. We might not notice areas where there's not complete transparency in the back, in the mask, um, because of all the detail in the image. You always want to go back in and check this mask, and it shows you our gray areas are where that transition area is before ground and background, and you can see exactly what your mask is doing. Now, I down here in the foreground, there's some semi-transparent areas, okay? I don't really want those in there because I don't want my foreground showing through to the background image, although it would be very subtle to pick up. Let's see if we see it in here. No, you know, you wouldn't see it, but I'm, you know, a little bit, you know, I, I like these things nicely done, so I want to take care of that. There's a couple of ways I can do that. They have a magic bucket tool here, and you can scale it in size. And what it does is it essentially looks for stray areas of, yeah, okay, it looks for stray mask areas, and you can see how it got rid of some of those things that we want. And I just, like, drag it over um, these areas just to clean it up a little bit. You can also take your mask, I mean your your paintbrush tool, oops, <laughs> undo. Okay, this is great. You know, I knew I was going to mess up today, and it just gives me an opportunity to show you something else that's great about the way that Mask Pro works. If you notice, you know, I took a swipe and subtracted out of the mask area that I want to keep. So I did a Command Z, which is an undo. What undo does in Mask Pro is it just undoes in small increments. If you want to get rid of the whole, whole brush stroke, you can go Shift Command Z and undo the complete stroke. So let's do that again. Oops. Now maybe I wanted part of it, but I went too far. You can simply Command Z back until it's where you want it or shift command Z to get rid of the whole thing. And clicking the X key gives me the plus and I can paint back in, you know, the areas that I was concerned about. Okay. All right. So let's go back. Let's take a look at the image. We're almost done here. I'm going to come over here, do the same thing, choose my magic brush. I'm going to widen the transition again. Make sure, now all the tools have this palette keep, keep, and this will add or delete color and just delete on this as well. So you, you set that where you want it and then you just go to town. All right, you, now you saw there that I went into the building a little bit and it erased part of that. I can actually midstream here, switch to the keep um, eyedropper, drag through that building, it adds it to my palette, go back to the magic brush, and then if I make sure that I'm in this middle mode where it keeps or drops, then I can paint back in, <laughs> making it a little worse, but you can, you can actually fine tune the process as you go, okay? And in this instance, I'm just going to go right in there, okay? Go back to my magic brush tool. And I'm going to harden up the transition a little bit. Okay. So the point is we're using all of these things together to create this wonderful 
Okay, check it out. Wow. Composite in a box. Okay, I'm just going to clean this up a little bit, make sure that this is set to zero. All right, I'm going to take my chisel. It's on there. Okay. Let's go a little more. All right, so let's see what this looks like. Not bad. Let's take a look at the mask. Not too bad. I see some stray things there. I'm going to grab that magic bucket tool, take care of those. And when you're happy with it, file, save, and apply. Now what it's done is it's put the layer mask onto my hyper-colored version of the rest stop. Let me get rid of the um, empty mask that we had. I'm going to just delete that to show you. What I do is hold down the Option or Alt key while I click and drag on this mask and it copies it to the appropriate layer. Now I take that layer and get rid of it. And I have, voila, my composite. And it looks just pretty much like I wanted. I'll show you one other thing that I actually did. And um, it uses um, a couple of different techniques. There's one thing, you know, about the foreground background thing. When you're looking at distant vistas like of these peaks, you get kind of the haziness in the air. And what I have done is I've just created that and it gives me separation again between foreground and background. And and quickly I create I don't know how much I should go into this, but yeah, okay, I will. Let me just do this. I'll show you real quick. I have an action that's set up to create a new layer and it fills it with um, neutral gray, absolute neutral gray. And it sets a blend mode of soft light. And what soft light will do is within the bounds of, you know, the um, both ends of complete black and complete white, it will either amplify anything above um, or below neutral gray. So the highlights will become brighter. The, the, if you paint on it with white, um, the shadows become darker. So it's a dodge burn layer. You can dodge and burn non-destructively non with this. And it's a great way to go. And then what I do is I take a gradient tool and I set it to, I'm gonna set this to 50% um, gray. 50% gray is 128. 128 and 128. I'm going to say OK to white. All right. Gray won't have any effect, but white will brighten. And so I'm going to start my gradient with white, end it in gray. And I'm going to drag on this layer up in a path like this. And I have, um, if I just look at that layer, I have this gradient from white to gray. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this down on top of the layer that I just created. And I'm going to clip it by holding the Option key down. And it clips that burn dodge layer to my image. And yeah, what I want is to clip it to the background image. Sorry, I was clipping it to the foreground. And now you can see how it's brightening the vista in behind. And the nice thing about doing it with this is that it's a separate layer. So I can take and move the layer up and down and can get the gradient exactly how I want it. So that's just a little trick. So what we end up with is I've got these layers with their burn dodge layers and everything and I'm calling and I make a group of it and I do that by selecting these layers command G creates a group from your selected layers 
So I've got a group of this finished composite of what my background is going to be. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, what I've done is I've created another document that's the same size. And what I want to do is bring that into a new document to work on uh, the next step of this composite. So I come up here, I duplicate group. You can name this anything you want. And then in the document, I choose the, I'll sh I have this cloud and launcher document that I've created. So that's the document that I'm going to select when I duplicate this. All right. So I'm duplicating this group and I'm going to send it to cloud and launcher too. And I'm going to call it finish composite and say, okay, now if I go to cloud and launcher two, it shows you the finished composite laid in there on top of this background. And what I can do now is create um, some texture image. And let's see if I've done that. Oh, that's one file that I didn't open up. Okay. So I'm going to shortcut this just a little bit by opening that particular file so that I can go from there. Okay. Give me just one second. <laughs> well, I think in my preparation for this class, I might have messed that file up. Let me try this. I have backup. Don't worry. Is everybody with me so far? How are we doing, Brian? Okay. This is this is this image. There's a lot of steps to this image, and and um, you know, so, okay. So here we go. All right. So essentially, what I did is this same thing. I brought it in, um, and let me switch here to this. I brought it in as the layered file that we just created by blending the foreground and background and creating this onto a new layer. What I did then is. I created um, a smart object from that layer. And you could do that by going layer, smart object, convert to smart object. And what that does, a smart object is, is really a nice um, advancement in Photoshop because it allows you to do a lot of things. And in compositing a number of layers together, some, oh, here, let me, you know, getting lost in documents. Mm -hmm. There we go. Some of what happens is you bring in an image and you'll inevitably, you will inevitably want to resize and rescale uh, the image. And inevitably, you know, you'll scale something down kind of small and commit it to a layer. And then as you're working later on, you'll decide, no, I want to change that and I want to scale it back up. Well, if you scale that layer back up after you've reduced it, you're, you're interpolating the image. You were making up data. It's not going to be as um, integral as the original data. With a smart object, it's only scaling the composite, all your resolution and everything stays the same. So it's a real nice way to work. The other reason it's a real nice way to work is that any filters that you apply to it become smart filters and editable um, in the software. So I've got some uh, smart filters that I've applied to this and I can go in at any time and adjust the degree of you know application of these sliders. So it's a it's a wonderful technique. That's a whole nother workshop. All right. Typically then I will add 
uh, my uh, texture layers, and then I've also incorporated another dodge burn layer with some of the outside surround burned down a little bit. And I'm getting sort of that toothy, gritty, fun background that I want to work on. All right, so it's time for the next step. The next step would be <laughs> mod. And this is, uh, this is a great uh, example. Um, one of the things in compositing that you always want to make sure is that you uh, are compositing appropriate foreground and background images. Um, you don't want to make it hard on yourself by choosing a foreground image that was shot you know, against a red background and then try and put it against a blue background. You can do it, but you're going to be working at it for a long time. So what I like to do is make sure when I'm um, compositing something is to look for similar colors background. And the background of this, um, well, let me find it, this image is fairly high key and it's going to work pretty nicely um, with Matt. So again, I'm going to lay this guy in on top of my background. I can do that by going duplicate layer, choosing the cloud launcher, say OK. Let me find that file. Here it is. Let's see if it came in. So here's some, yep, here we are on top of that. And actually, I'm going to close that file. I'm going to put him in a different file. Sorry. This is the penalty I'm paying for doing this live. Right? <laughs> OK. Don't save. All right. Composite background PSD is where I want Mott to live. Let's go back to that file, duplicate layer, and composite background, and say, OK. Go into our composite background, and it's plopped him in the middle here. And I'm going to drag him up on top. And I'm going to reduce his opacity. And then we're going to position him. Command T to transform, and we're going to zip him down. And I want him kind of in here. Like that. Now, some kind of cool things when you're doing a free transform um, that you can do. You can take this little center point, if you grab it and move it. I want his shoulder to stay in bounds so I can grab that and move it right down there. And now when I pivot the image, his shoulder doesn't move out of bounds. It's just like I can, I can put him exactly where I want it. Okay. So pretty cool. Anyway, I'll get it all set where I want it. Say okay. Bring the opacity back up. And then we're going to work on putting him against the background. So the background is visible behind him. So I'm going to create the mask where my Mask Pro mask is going to want to live and go into Mask Pro. Automate Mask Pro. Boy, I think I'm long-winded. OK. <laughs> All right, here we go. So here it is. And what we're going to do is zoom in here and go into like 200%. And I'm going to, this is going to be a color challenge because the pin tool would be ridiculous. Um, so this is going to be a color bias thing. And I'm going to take the keep and I'm going to select a good tonal range of his hair. So some of the light tones in here, some of the darker tones. I'm actually going to double click on that and lighten it even further. OK, so that I have a good range here. Maybe even some of his um, skin tones. OK, for the keep colors. And then drop colors, I type 0. Go in here with the drop tool to make some selections, all right, and then select the magic brush tool. Now, I want to see what this looks against, like against my uh, background. So I'm going to select this 
icon with the little rainbow in it, which is the layers beneath um, icon. And I'm going to select a very soft transition. And uh, brush size is OK. Maybe feather it just a little bit more. And then start to paint. And you can see the background coming in very nicely. It's just like magic, which is probably why they titled it Magic Brush. All right. Wow. No, I'm happy. OK. Now you can always take the little chisel tool. Let's bring it up just a little bit. Oops, I had it set to positive. Shift, Command Z, gets rid of the entire keystroke. Come up here, set that to subtract. Absolutely blends it, blends it right in. Okay, nicely fine-tuned. So I'm going to switch tools. I'm going to go ahead and go in here to uh, my magic brush, and let's just take it out that way. Okay. Nice. Okay. All right. So now let's take a look at the mask and see. All right. Now so you see this gray area. If I was to fill in the rest of this area, we would be in some trouble. So I want to go back in and I can use with my mask or my magic brush tool still on. I can just soften this transition just a little bit or, and let's see what happens there. Let me make sure I've got this set to get rid of. Yeah, all right. That's a little too much. Going to go back a little bit. So again, you get the idea. You really, and you can using all these tools, you can watch as you do it. Now I'm going to click on the um, d drop color button. Go back in. M for the magic brush. Look at that. So you can fine tune it as you go. All right. And so I encourage everybody to really, you know, follow up with this, um, these transition um, sliders to watch what you're doing and to go in and add and drop um, colors as you go. And you can really fine tune it very nicely. So let me click this guy in here. All right. I'm going to use the chisel tool to get rid of that. So I'm plus. OK, so I'm running a little bit behind. So I'm going to go ahead, make sure that I have a clean path. I am going to um, get this thing kind of put together for you. So I've got black all the way around now. So I can use this. Click in there to delete. Take a look and see what it looks like. Looks pretty good. I've got a little bit here, but I can work on that later. I'm going to go ahead and save it, save and apply. And you can see where I'm going with this. So now, one other thing I should tell you, since we've put this mask on its own layer mask, you can come in here and always work on this mask. It's a grayscale image. I missed this little part. I can take my brush scale my brush down with black paint, go ahead and just paint on the mask. Here's another thing. The transition areas on this mask, it's a grayscale, so I can come in here and work on the mask. I can fix this really easily just with a little dodging and burning. Let's just dodge the highlights just a little bit on this mask, okay? 
So we have gone through, we've used both the pin tools to use like on the hard edge surfaces. We have used the color tools, the keep drop colors, and shown how we can adjust those selections to create um, a color selection and dropping in the hair. And what I was explaining there was you can actually use this mask then um, to fine tune. If I was, um, you know, if, if you want to tighten up even further some of the uh, image, you can actually take and run like a, a levels command on the mask layer itself. Right. right, so what I did was holding on the option key, I am looking at the mask that we created. And what, I, what we can do is it's grayscale. So if I do like a um, levels command, watch what happens to the edge of the mask. If I want to increase the white area, you can watch it grow as I drag that that way. You can see how it creeps in here, all right? If I want to contract the mask a little bit, just drag the blacks in. It just, it just is like burning those blacks. And so it can tighten up so you can see what happens there. You can also come in here. I can see that I've got a little contamination in his ear. I can take burn dodge tool, okay? Let me get rid of that. I can take um, dodge the highlights a little bit and clean that right up, okay? So it's just a grayscale mask. That's the beauty of um, a layer mask like that. I'm going to uh, I'm going to shortcut. Then I've taken this rocket. I've used the pin tool to completely outline this rocket, and I'm going to show you really kind of the basics of where we ended up with our composite. So, so with our filters and things applied, this is this is where we came from. So here's the composite that we built earlier with the masks. I've applied some filters to it. I've applied a few um, hue saturation and curves adjustments to it. Um, I've layered in, where's my texture layer must be in here with the, the rocket, but um, we've layered in um, matte and applied some smart filters to him. Then we laid in, let's see, where's my rocket? Here's my rocket. And we laid in the rocket and then built, <laughs> built a lot of other layers and effects along the way to create um, this little liftoff picture. And then I've consolidated it all to its own layer and then run a little crunchy tonal adjustment to the mid-tones to really snap it up and you end up with this. So again, masking is all about uh, creating a grayscale mask uh, with either on a hard line basis with the pin tools or color differentiation basis with the keep and drop colors. And I encourage everyone to really work at understanding the sliders and um, Sam, you know, sampling different um, in different ways and different colors so that you really get an understanding. But the beauty is all that is in one place and can provide you with all the tools that can really do a wonderful job to create um, good masks that are necessary when you're doing composites like this. And that's it in a nutshell. That's, uh, that's fantastic, Doug. Uh, the comments have been, uh, I mean, through the roof for real. And I have a few questions that Good. came through. The first question is in regards to the textures. When you apply your textures, first, if you can show the textures you've applied, but also can you speak to the blending modes that you uh, think work best for these? <laughs> you bet. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a seminar in itself. So there's no real quick answers. Let me see if I can find the composite. I'm going to get into the one that's got the textures on this. So this is, this image is a little bit of, a, of an anomaly because I have the textures grouped as a layer um, over the top of this. And 
that's not always the case. A lot of times they're really integrated in or they form the base of a layer. But I can certainly show, let me turn this off and this will give you kind of a picture of what the combination of all these images um, provides. Like the sliders, um, textures are something that you can really um, play with. Uh, and the same thing can be said for blending modes. Um, right now, let us let me start back here. So I'll apply one texture and it'll be easier to see. So this is an old wall that's got some hairline cracks and, you know, kind of a nice patina. And I've got it set to, to multiply. So it's multiplying the white background. Uh, we turn on this, I believe it's the same layer and I have it set to soft light. Like I mentioned before, soft light and overlay. Soft light is the kinder, gentler sister to the big bad overlay older brother. Um, overlay is a little harder um, in its amplification of the highlights and shadows. Um, soft light won't take the highlights or shadows, um, it won't block up the highlights or shadows. So I apply a little soft light with the same layer over the top of the multiply layer, which just sort of pops it a little bit. And since most of that texture image is highlights, you can see how it's primarily brightened the whole thing just a little bit, but it's also made some of that texture pop just a little bit more. Um, then I've taken another texture and laid it in over the top again with soft light and all this stuff doesn't happen as a formula. It happens as I lay it in, I cycle through, uh, you know, different blend modes to see the effect that these blend modes have on, you know, the composite. So it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm not an engineer, I'm an artist, and so I experiment like crazy, but not like an engineer would. And here's, an, here's a real good tip if you're thinking about blend modes. If you hold, uh, if you choose a non-brush um, tool, like the move tool, I always just go straight to the move tool. And if you hold down the shift, and you're, you're selecting here, if you hold down the shift key, if you go shift plus, it cycles through the blend modes and I cycle through the blend modes until I see what I like. And then I go, yeah, that looks good. And then I use the opacity slider to dial it in a little bit. Now there's a lot more to it and there's a, you know, probably some underlying, yeah, blend if sliders. So I also adjust how much one layer affects the layer below. Okay. So there's a lot going on, but the basics is, you're not going to know what's right until it pops up on the screen. And so I know the tools to cycle through the blend modes until I figure out what's right. And if it's almost right, but not quite right, then I play a little detective game. It's like, well, if it didn't affect the blacks so much, then it would be right. And I go in and I adjust maybe the blend if sliders. So there's a lot there, but typically, um, yeah, there's a lot of different, blend modes that amplify lights, amplify darks, um, multiply to darken, screen to lighten, and you can also apply it as a clipping path to just specific areas of your image. So I hope that helps. There's a lot more information where that comes from. No, that was, that was perfect. Um, and I really appreciate how um, you know how much time you're putting in this. I have one question that was asked earlier from an attendee, and I thought it was really good to bring up. And it's it's more of a it's a softer question. It's not so much um, a technical question. But so you did a demo of your composite images at the beginning, and you went through an entire webinar of this composite. How do you how do you attack this? How do you approach compositing? You know, choosing you know what. I want mod over here and I want that rocket ship over here or your any other one like the, that plate with the person who's reading a newspaper. How does this, how do you approach it? Because a lot of people are wondering that. Well, 
Um, I, you know, that's that's the art part. That's that's kind of the vision, and really the way primarily that it happens for me, I believe. Let's go back here to look at some of these. Um, so, I mean, here is the beginning images for this composite, and so it began with this like thought of, oh my God, you know, this would be some like a big kid's toy, and. I call it, and and it made me think then of this shot that I had done in the studio of this guy with his uh-oh appearance. And so you just, you know, you begin, you, you collect all these images in, um, you know, in your library, and then you go through your library constantly. You you know what you have, and then as you're looking at an image like the image of this um, funny machine, you think about what it could be or what it maybe means to you. And it, after being in China with their um, you know their their cities so packed with people and the you know the cacophony of the crowded cities, I just had to think that these people had to be dreaming in some way of a simpler life, and I thought. Oh, wait, I've got this like exam plate thing that's just uber cool. It's, you know, kind of a steampunk kind of thing. I can I can build an image that that works this way. And so I thought, okay, I gotta put a person behind it, and then, you know, you go through your library and you just and of course the selections that you make of what images go together, um is very much a detective process and it's the same one you face when you go out shooting you know how do you decide what pictures to shoot or how do you decide what textures to use or how do you decide how you want to crop it or tone it or color it and so those are real personal things and it's an exploration process in my workshops I call it the detective process the detective process is you have to there's something in the picture that's not right. You first have to identify what that is, then fix that, and then go on to the next what's not right. And when you run out of things that aren't right, and it's all right, then you're done. That's the best way I can describe it.